<laughs> okay, so this is using application programming interfaces here, or known as API, of data repositories to create local data catalogs. And our specific example today is the API from Pasta. And this is uh, this session today is a collaboration of four LTER information managers. This is typical of how LTER information managers get together to uh, do work together. Um, Dwayne Costa is the programmer at Pasta, uh, <laughs> the programmer at EDI, <laughs> um, and Stephen Earle, the information manager from CAP LTER, John Porter from Virginia Coastal Reserve, and myself, Gastel Buell, from the Maria Coral Reef LTER site. Uh, next slide. So I'm glad to see there's some people here who are not from LTER, so you might not actually have heard of Pasta before. Pasta is the software that runs the data catalog for EDI, the Environmental Data Initiative, which includes LTER. And Pasta, before EDI, Pasta was the software that ran the catalog for the LTR network. Uh, so now we're Pasta Plus. Data Portal is what we call the user interface to Pasta. And Data Portal itself is an example of using the Pasta API web services to run a data catalog. Um, so it's just one example, but you could also use the API to run your own local catalog, and that's what today's talk is about. Next slide. This is a screenshot of the data portal, and I looked for Apostle Opera, which is something very specific to one site, so very few data sets. Uh, there are, what, 5,000, 50,000 data sets in Pasta? How many? Yeah, around 50,000. Um, you can quickly subset it. So wh why would you want to drive your local catalog from the Pasta API? It, it's a great idea for several reasons. The, the main two we want to, I'm going to cover, are that uh, when I compared the LTR sites, local data catalogs that we now have, uh, there's 28 sites now, is that right, Kristen? Yeah, uh, so, which include a few new sites, but I only looked at not new sites. Uh, and I looked at features that are currently offered by the local sites and compared those to the features which the Pasta API can provide. And, um, and we, I also looked at the visual layout and user interface of the local catalogs. Those vary widely, and there's nothing to keep you from styling and designing your user interface how you want while still under the hood using the catalog services from, the, from Pasta. So this is my graph of Pastability. On the left, you have uh, whether or not Pasta serves at, through its interface the given feature for a data catalog. We have various features, ways of filtering result, the result set, uh, whether you can see a subset of the data right away, a little preview, whether it has a, a map visual of the location of data sets, uh, filtering data sets by how popular they are, <laughs> how many downloads, pagination of search results, um, how recent the data is. These are all features that are either recommended best practices for local site catalogs or things the sites thought up of uh, on their own. And one thing more about that slide I just wanted to show is that, well, don't need the visual to show it. Those features which are seen most commonly are available already from Pasta. And any new feature asked, added to Pasta would then become available to all sites. They wouldn't each have to code it themselves. So why drive your local catalog from Pasta? Because you, there's more possibilities. <laughs> uh, it, general idea is the software is written once, so it's more maintainable, sustainable, uh, and then read many times. So there's the efficiency of scale there. Um, and just because you're using the Pasta API under the hood does not preclude you from having your own custom user interface or design or branding. So you get the best of both worlds. Oh, I'm doing objectives? Yeah, you, you're welcome to do objectives. Um, but I'm just going to re reading them off the well, screen. So why don't you go ahead and do objectives? Okay, anyway, uh, basically uh, what we're going to try to do in this session is, uh, first of all, let, let me mention that the, the idea of basically having a back-end repository that's actually doing the heavy lifting for your data catalog or your data listing, however you want to 
want to want to set it up is uh, uh, is is more general than just pasta, but we're going to sort of give you an example using pasta. And so what we want to know is show you is how you can use the web services and Dwayne is going to do a job on that and talk about uh, solar queries if you haven't run into those before. And then, uh, and then we have a couple demonstrations of actually using it uh, to, uh, uh, let's see, we got two microphones on, that's a very bad idea. Uh, anyway, um, and then we're going to give you a couple of examples uh, and, uh, of, how, of actually application of, uh, of doing that. So Dwayne, I'll hand it over to you and you have the choice of either holding the microphone or doing the other one. You're going to be page first. I can. Okay. Thanks, John. Uh, as Gastel already mentioned, my name is Dwayne Costa. I'm a developer with the Environmental Data Initiative. And today, my portion of the talk will focus on actually using the Pasta Plus a search API. So Gastel has already touched upon some of this, but what would be the motivation for using the Pasta Plus search API? Uh, we're emphasizing this afternoon building your a local data catalog. Um, it would ensure that your search results and your local data catalog are automatically synchronized with the contents of a central data catalog, avoiding any inconsistencies. And of course, this involves lower maintenance because you're letting Pasta or Pasta Plus automatically retrieve the list of data packages it holds for your local site instead of maintaining that list on your own. There are other motivations. For example, maybe you pr would like to build a custom search interface different from the search interface offered by the centralized data portal. For example, your custom search interface might want to restrict search results to a particular geographic area. Also, uh, the pasta repository is uh, a, something that could be mined for data, where the EML metadata stored there is the data to be mined. I've listed a few examples here. You could probably think of better ones. Uh, if you wanted to do an analysis of what is the average number of keywords used in EML metadata, uh, how many LTR sites are using LTR core areas keywords and which keywords and so forth. And finally, for efficiency, using the search, um, using a single web service call can, can return a lot of information and it's usually very fast, even for complex search queries. Uh, and this can often be more efficient for you than using the centralized search interface where the search results are returned in HTML and uh, you have to page through them 10 results at a time. Next slide. Uh, throughout uh, my portion of the presentation, you'll be hearing a lot about solar. Solar is the popular blazing fast search platform on, um, on which Pasta Plus search is built. Solar in, in turn is built on a technology called Apache Lucene, and I won't go into either of these in detail, but they're both amazing technologies. In this very highly technical diagram, we see a basic client uh, server uh, transaction where the client makes a request using HTTP, interfacing with Pasta Plus's REST API, and Pasta Plus processes that request, and in this case, sending the request uh, the query to the solar within Pasta, Pasta Plus, the solar server, uh, a response is generated in the form of search results and sent back to the client. Elaborating on this uh, just a bit further, uh, we see that the data portal, and in, for Pasta there are two sister data portals, the portal for the EDI repository at portal.edi, I'm sorry, the EDI data portal at portal.edirepository.org, and another view of that uh, same repository, uh, the LTER data portal at portal.lterNet.edu. Uh, the, the data portal interfaces through uh, Pasta's gatekeeper. Uh, that request is sent to the data package manager, then to Solar, and then the response is generated and sent in through the reverse route. Uh, it's really not important to understand the specifics here. The important thing to understand is that this get uh, request uh, is a search API that you can use in the same way that the data portals use them. There's really no difference. You have this available to you through your programs, your browser, a curl command, your script, 
anything that can execute an HTTP GET request and handle the XML response that comes back, it has, has this API available to it. So let's look at the API uh, before we do that. Uh, I would like to break down the um, understanding of the Pasta Plus Search API into three fairly simple steps. First, we have to understand what is indexed in Pasta Plus in, in its solar server, which fields are retrievable. If we don't understand what is indexed, then we won't know what it is involved in constructing good queries if we don't know what's queryable. Um, second, we have to know how to construct that query, compose it, and send it to Pasta Plus. And third, we have to understand what the search results are, what format that they're in, and how to parse them in terms of what gets sent back to us. Uh, a note on that first um, item there, indexing, is that not all metadata fields in an EML document are indexed. Uh, not all fields are what we consider queryable. For example, EML involves declaring a format string uh, for uh, date-time attributes uh, so that machine processing and so forth will understand what format the date-time value is in. In this case, the standard yyyy.mm.dd. We don't really consider that text, yyyy.mm.dd, the format string, something that anyone would necessarily want to search on, and so we don't index, index that. Maybe someone can make the case that it, it's something that is search-worthy, but until then, uh, we're not going to index it. Yes? Oh, uh, yes. Yes, ecological metadata language. Um, currently, all of the documents in PASTA are retrievable as EML or as Dublin Core metadata. So here is the list of fields that are searchable in PASTA Plus. Uh, we have a number of identifiers, such as the scope, which is sort of a namespace for a document, in this case, in this example, EDI. Uh, the ID of that document, for example, EDI.1. Uh, the full package ID includes a revision number for that document, so EDI.1.1. And we also have DOI identifiers that are minted uh, through EDI for every document within Pasta Plus, and that is searchable. We have a number of string and text fields. Uh, most of them are self-explanatory, so I won't describe them. And we also have uh, temporal fields and spatial fields that are searchable uh, by date range and by spatial coordinates. Here's the basic API. Uh, we make a HTTP GET request and it's always to the same URL. In fact, if you wanted to start typing this into your browser, you could try out a few examples as we go along here. HTTPS colon slash slash pasta dot LTE rnet dot edu slash package slash search slash email. The important part of the query is everything that comes after the question mark, the query parameters, and that's the thing we will vary from one request to another. So let's start with the first example, a fairly simple one. After the question mark, we have two query parameters, Q equals keyword colon disturbance, and FL equals ID. So we're asking Pasta to search for all documents that have a keyword that match the value disturbance. And uh, this is a case insensitive search. Secondly, we're asking only for the ID field of that document, for example, EDI.1, to be returned. So Using this interface is very simple, right? Only two parameters. Well, let's go on to a second, more complex example, this time with eight query parameters, some of them are a bit complex. In this case, I've, I've um, composed this example as a curl command, which means that instead of executing it through a browser, this is something you could execute using the curl program. It's available on Windows or Linux, um, and you type it out in your command window and, and run uh, a RESTful web service this way. And so in this case, uh, we're asking curl to use the get HTTP method, which is what your browser generally does by default. And we're placing in quotes, in double quotes this time, the entire URL. This is so that um, your command shell will not 
get mixed up and think that the ampersands are meaningful to the command shell, so we have to quote the whole URL. Our first query parameter is fairly long, Q equals percent 22 air plus temperature percent 22 plus and plus title colon arctic. That's the first query parameter. So let's unpack that and make sense of it. We're asking for to query on the term air temperature as one term. And so we're doing a little bit of URL encoding here because we have to, in, to treat it as one term with, it, with an enclosed space, we have to put quotes around it. But we already have quotes around the entire URL, so we can't use them a second time. So we use URL encoding of double quotes, which is percent %22. The plus is also a common URL encoding you've probably seen a lot of times representing a space in a URL. It could also be percent %20. And we're, so we're asking for the term air temperature and we want to match within the title of the document the, the text Arctic. It has to be within the title in this case because we specify that title colon Arctic. In our second query parameter, FQ equals minus sign scope colon ecotrends. FQ is a filtered query. It's very much like a query. They're almost the same thing. Except when you use a filtered query, you're generally just trying to filter your search results without those, that query criteria being counted towards the relevance score that's being calculated by Lucene and Solar. So it's, it's just pure filtering without having that term be counting towards relevance scoring because the search results that come back all have a score in terms of how strong a match they were with your query. Yes? And this is a good point, good question. The negative sign is an exclusionary uh, qualifier. So in this, in this case, we're explicitly <coughs> excluding all Ecotrends project documents. So if you wanted to construct a query, you didn't want the search results to include any of the 15,430 or so Ecotrends project documents, this is the kind of query you would construct. If you were to remove the negative sign, you would be insisting that only Ecotrends documents be included in your search results. Now we go on to the third parameter, FL, the field list. We're asking for the fields to be returned to be the package ID, the title, the score. The score is not something we index in solar. Uh, solar offers a, as a field that we can return. It's a floating point value that it um, computes for each matching document. And so if you wanted to see how strongly these documents are matching, we ask for the score field to be included. And then we have a couple of sort parameters. We're asking to sort on score descending, and this is search interface will, interfaces will common, commonly do this for their end users. They want the end users to see the most relevant uh, matches first from highest score to lowest. But we have a secondary score in case of ties to sort on package ID ascending. And finally, uh, kind of a cryptic parameter, def type equals edis max. I'll describe that a little bit on the next slide. And then we, we instruct um, that we want to start from index zero of the documents that are matched and include only 10 rows. This is the default. If you leave out the start and rows parameters, yes. I'm sorry? Okay. I'll finish what I was saying. I didn't mean to interrupt you. It's all right. But, um, so you've got two sort yeah. uh, parameters. That's right. And their order matters? It does, yeah. It's a, it's a primary sort and a secondary sort. So first it will sort on score. And in case of ties on score, okay. then it will sort in package. Order in these I, I'm pretty sure, yeah. I mean, you could try this out. But yeah, uh, yeah I'm pretty sure the order does matter. Um, and finally, as uh, the start and rows values are, those are the defaults. Start with zero and give, uh, provide 10 rows. Uh, if we're constructing a search interface where we're paging through search results, this would be our first query uh, that we, if we want to display 10 results, if the user clicks on the next button, all right, we would rerun this query this time with start equals 10 and rows equals 10. When they go to page three, it would be start equals 20 and rows equals 10 and so forth. That's how we do paging. Sorry. 
Okay, this EDIS max. Um, this, this gets into uh, various query parser types that are available to us through solar, the Lucene's or standard parser versus the DISMAX parser versus the EDISMAX parser. Uh, DEF type stands for default type, in which we're specifying the uh, query parser. If you leave that out, you get the standard Lucene parser, which is, has an expressive syntax, but supposedly, I haven't found this to be the case myself, but supposedly it can be a little fussy about user input. It's not as user friendly and can generate errors. Uh, there was another more advanced parser developed called the DISMAX or disjunction maximum parser. You would specify def type equals DISMAX. However, this has been deprecated in favor even of a, a more expanded parser called the extended disjunction maximum parser or def type equals EDISMAX which essentially combines the best of the Lucene and DISMAX parsers. Uh, and it's said to be the best choice for applications that accept user input. Uh, the, the data portals always specify def type equals EDISMAX in their search interfaces so that hopefully we're gonna reduce the number of places where the parser gets tripped up on user input. Let's look at the search results that come back from Pasta Plus. Uh, in this example query, I've asked Q equals package ID KNB LTR NIN.1.1. That's a North Inlet LTR data package with identifier one and revision one. So it's one very specific data package I'm asking for. And my second parameter is FL equals the wildcard asterisk. So in this case, I'm asking for all fields available for one data package. I'm saying, give me everything you've got stored for that one document. And as expected, number, num found is one in our result set. So the outer element of this XML is called the result set element. It's, it's reporting in its first attribute that we matched one document and that it used parameters start equals zero and rows equals 10, the default. Within that result set document, we have the single document element that was matched. And within that, the various fields that it's indexed for that document, abstract, DOI, um, they're all pretty much self-explanatory. We'll go on to the next slide, slide and see the rest of this. Yes? I, I, I was just thinking that, I was surprised, there's no like, redirect, there's no link, like, there's no link to the main page, like, or link to the main How am I going to be able to display this without the user agreeing to the actual table? Uh, we'll, we'll actually demo that. Yeah. Yes. But it may be a, an enhancement we should talk about uh, adding to the search results. Good point. Uh, you can see in the rest of these uh, indexed fields that uh, we have things like spatial coordinates. On the previous slide, there were, I believe, I believe start date and end date or single date time. So these are other, as I mentioned, things that can be searched on. And we, it, it XML ends with the closing document and result set tags. Um, I'll briefly mention that there is an alternative method in using the Pasta web services other than the search API. I call this the, the list and read APIs. So there are, a number of, there are over 50 Pasta web services. I'm highlighting one of them, the search API. But there are others that will return lists of documents in the repository in terms of what scopes, identifiers, and revisions are stored, and a, a web service that returns the complete EML XML for a single document. That's the read metadata web service. So this combination of listing and reading web services could do a lot of what the search API is doing. doing. Uh, but you would need to write a program that runs these list web services and then reads individual EML documents and parses them, examining and processing the specific elements you're interested in working with. Next slide. So if we compare and contrast these two methods, with the search API approach, it's a one and done. One call to the search API generally returns everything you need in one shot. It's fast even for very complex queries. They execute in a flash. You can search on spatial and temporal ranges, and it takes advantage of the sophisticated Solar and Lucene query logic with relevant scoring and such. 
However, there are a couple of minor disadvantages. With the search API approach, we're limited to the newest revision of any given document. When a newest revision is uploaded to Pasta, it replaces in the search uh, database all previous revisions. That's not true in Pasta itself, only in Solar, where we index these documents. And the second disadvantage is that, as I mentioned before, it would be limited to only the queryable subset of EML content, things like title, keywords, abstract, and methods, and so forth, that are actually indexed in, by Pasta Plus in Solar. With the alternative approach, the list and read methods, uh, it could require hundreds or even thousands of individual calls to Pasta web services to do, pull in all of the identifiers you need and then read those individual metadata documents. This could take several minutes to execute. There's no built-in capability to query on spatial or temporal criteria. You'd have to program that logic yourself. Uh, in fact, any query cr criteria is not built in. You, you have to provide that logic by programming it yourself. However, the advantages are that you would have access to all revisions, including older revisions, not just the newest. And you could access all of the EML content because you'd be reading in the full EML metadata, like that little format string field we talked about earlier. This would be accessible to you in the list and read approach. But returning to the search API um, and thinking about possible future enhancements to it, perhaps there are other fields we should be indexing that we're not currently indexing. Uh, maybe somebody would, will one day make a case for that format string field. Uh, this isn't terribly difficult. It requires some minor code changes on the part of the POSTA developers, some testing, and then we have to run an overnight re-indexing of everything in the POSTA repository it has to be re-indexed in Solar, which generally runs for about 10 to 12 hours. Um, Bob, go back to, please. Yeah, I was just thinking about that second point there. <laughs> uh, no, the next slide, yeah, still hold on to that one. Okay, so for potential future enhancements, one thing I haven't discussed is that Solar itself has its own XML that it returns. It's a different, structure different, different from how Pasta returns it. I think Pasta's format is a bit more human readable, a little more intuitive. However, there may be programs out there that already are written to work with Solar native XML format. And so we may consider offering a, a version of the Pasta Plus Search API, which returns the XML in Solar format instead of Pasta format. And if there are other enhancements that you can think of or any bugs you find that you feel need to be reported, please let us know. There'll be a resources slide at the end. And now I'd like to move into a demo of some of these search API calls. Uh, so John, if you could on each of these, I'm going to talk a little. I'm going to talk a little about the the URL, and then when when ready, we can run it by. Um, if you right click on the URL, and this is. All right. Not yet. Uh, first, I'll talk about what it's what we expect from it. So this was that first example. You may have already run this in your browser. Keyword disturbance and field list is we're only asking for the ID field. Yes. And there we go. Um, we've got ten. There were twelve thousand and four matches. We're only seeing the first ten, and we're getting the IDs of those documents. Uh, from LTR, Lucio, and Sevieta sites. Now if we could go back. <laughs> and this, the second one is, um, we're, this is an interesting one because I'm saying Q equals wildcard asterisk. That means match anything anywhere <laughs> in any field. However, we're, and we're saying give us all the fields. So we're essentially saying give us everything you've got in pasta. However, include only one row in the search results. And uh, so it's, this is, it matched all 42,393 documents. However, it's starting at index zero, giving us one row. And this is a document from uh, KBS, uh, Kellogg Biological Station, LTER, identifier 128. And it, we see all the fields that were indexed for that one document. What's that? Um, 
I guess the, the relevant scoring was probably one giant tie. <laughs> and the, the, there's, other than that, there was no implied ordering there. And now in our third example, uh, this, this use case is, now we're getting into something that would be usable in constructing a data catalog. Uh, for the Florida Coastal Everglades site, which has scope KNB LTER FCE, we're asking uh, for, to query on that scope and give us a field list of things that we might want to display in a, a table of search results for an end user, the package ID, the title, the author, the DOI, maybe we'd want to include the abstract. And we're asking for a thousand rows. We know there are fewer than 200 of these documents, so a thousand should cover all of them. And we can go ahead and run that. Then we have a fairly lengthy XML document returned with everything. There were 150, it looked like 158 or three. Everything from the Florida Coastal Everglades site. In, the, in that first example, top, top example, I use Q equals scope colon. Uh, let's go back. There was a second one on that slide. Yeah. In, in the bottom one, I'm, it's just a slight variation on the first one. And this time I'm saying query on anything that matches, Q equals asterisk, and uh, but filter query on scope, KNB, LTR, FCE, all of the Florida Coastal Everglades. And we get exact, we should get exactly the same number, 159, was it? So it's, a, it's two different ways to get to the same result. Uh, here's a long one. Uh, I had this one. I think this is essentially the same one that I presented as my sec second example in the slides. And so we can go ahead and run it. I think I'm asking for 20 rows in this one. We had 37 matches. This was Arctic in the title. And something else matched anywhere. Air temperature matched anywhere else. And these are the results that were returned. And we can see the scores. So that uh, first one with a score of 1.7 beat out all the others. They were, they were ordered descending by score. And I believe if we were to scroll down, we'd see some ties. And then we'd see those ordered ascending by package ID. <laughs> you want that back no, no. It... <laughs> That's OK. Okay, so John is scrolling down for us, and if you stop and we, we uh, go a little higher, I think there were a few ties in there with 1.451.2658. You can see these should be ordered ascending by package ID, and I believe they are. Uh, here's a query. Oh, okay, yes, yes, thank you. Uh, this is, I forget what the query was. We're asking for keyword disturbance for all EDI scoped documents, I believe. Yeah, field query, uh, filter query equals scope colon EDI. And we're asking for the ID and the title only. And it only matched one EDI document. We need more docs on disturbance, guys. <laughs> okay. Um, querying on author, I'm going to query on myself as an author. So author, Q equals author, colon, Duane plus Costa. And I think I had a filter query to say that the author field must contain the word Costa. We had four document matches, the three, um, three top three I am credited as an author, uh, mainly through the generosity of these co-authors who decided to include me on these documents. And I think on the final one, we matched Scott Costa, who I'm sure is a much better author than me, but in this particular query, wound up with a lower score. <coughs> and five of five, I'm gonna skip, we could run one of these. And, uh, it, oh, wait a minute, four of five. Okay, yes, okay. Yes, one more to do on this one. Um, fairly complex one, we're asking for a subject of primary production with, once again, these URL encoded double quotes. Um, or, this time we're using some of this and or logic again, or subject plant. We're asking to exclude ecotrends and um, exclude scopes that start with LTER-Landsat star. So any, um, there's another like 15 or 20,000 LTR Landsat data packages that we, we might want to exclude 
asking for a, lar a long list of fields. We're setting debug to false, which I don't think is really necessary to include, but it, it is an option. Uh, starting at zero, rows equals 10. Once more, sorting by score descending, and we're explicitly asking for the EDIS max query parser. So let's go ahead and run that. And we've matched 1,813 documents. You can see the uh, spatial coverage coordinates included as, as one of the fields that we asked for. These queries, I'm not going to go into. Uh, they're quite complex. They have to do with temporal and spatial criteria. They are very long queries. Uh, the syntax is quite involved. If, if you uh, want to delve into this, contact me and we could go over it together. But if you want to run one of them, um, in the first one, we're asking for everything that matches the time range January 1st, 1995 through December 31st, 1996. And the query is constructed in a way that those two dates, any dates within the document must fall within those two dates. There's a, the second query is constructed such that the document can overlap that time period at any point and they will be included. So there are some real subtleties in there into how to construct those queries. But let's go ahead and run the first one. And we should see that any either single dates or begin dates and end dates included in the results are within that two year time period. We match 1,683 documents. And uh, we, we won't, that's okay, we can skip the other two. And uh, here are some resources available uh, for those who'd like to understand solar better, the book Solar in Action, I found it particularly helpful. I think that's it. Thank you and happy searching. See, so, yeah, we're switch, do a little switch over here. Uh, I'm actually, uh, somehow I estimated exactly, more or less, how many uh, copies I would need of this. I actually have... Uh, the, uh, all of the code that was used to do this demonstration, and yes, it fits on both sides of one sheet of paper. So uh, I'll send those back there. Uh, it's not necessary, by the way, for you to understand the code. I just figured that for those of you who did understand, who liked code, you should have some. Uh, yes, and, and there will be in just a moment, there will be, uh, there's also, uh, there's a uh, GitHub uh, site that has all of the, uh, the, the, the demo materials, plus some stuff. Question. Yeah. How do I ask for all the rows? Um, if I, with a really high number, like rows equals 100,000. <laughs> Uh, that, that should cover everything. I don't think rows equals stars will work. Yeah, so, yeah, so the, yeah, just, just set it to be 10 billion and you're probably safe. Uh, although, it, don't count on it coming back immediately. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, what, uh, what we wanted to do now is to back off from some of the technical stuff a little bit. This is you now have in your hands or on, the, on that little piece of code everything you need to implement a system that will allow you to search and provide a customized feedback of, uh, of the web. So let's, uh, I'll fire off a, a demo here. So what I've done is I've now actually gone to a live website and we have a, uh, oh, somebody tell me something that they would like to search for. Kelp? Oh, gosh. You can see Mar Margaret is here because that's all it does. Let me see if I can. That better? <laughs> uh, now, uh, we're going to search all the LTR sites, although we, there's only one of them that really has kelp. Uh, and now let's uh, decide what sort of an output form would we like. Would we like an HTML table or would we like some text or would you like to get a comma separated value listing of all of these, of all of these Kelpie data sets? <laughs> Somebody tell me which one they'd like to, like to HTML, H, table. HTML table it is. Okay, so HTML table, we do search for data. 
and boom, uh, yeah, let's make that a little bit smaller there. What we now have are, is a listing of the first 100 kelp data sets that are there. Now, the way this is, uh, uh, so that's, a, that's sort of an example. And then in this case here, what I've done is made it so that there is a link here, but rather than actually styling it on this site itself, because that wouldn't fit on one page, uh, I've got it so that uh, it will actually take us to the, the actual portal and, um, and pull up that document. Let's say, yeah, there we go. So there's, there's actually the, uh, where we would actually get that data set and get more information on it. So um, the, um, yep. so what's, what's happening there? Okay, well, one of the things is that you are, uh, we specified what we wanted to have done. So that was that we, we gave it a query on that web form. We then uh, uh, used a PHP program to prepare that query, actually use, uh, and then use curl, uh, the command line URL. Uh, uh, the, the command line, essentially a web browser that runs on the command line to actually go to pasta to get it. And then you've seen the result sets that, uh, that Dwayne was showing you there, the things that came back. And then we took and ran that through a style sheet processor. Okay? <clears throat> and then that produced our HTML catalog listing. And we can make the, the, that PHP program has the logic in it and the, the web form has the logic in it that we can actually choose what style sheet we'd like to use. So that if we decide that we don't want an HTML table, we can select a different style sheet and the appearance will be different. It's still the same result set that's being processed, but uh, let's tell you what, I'll do the one that looks like text there. Let's, uh, let's see. Nope. Yeah, get back to this. Um, I could do text here and I'll say uh, kelp again. And now instead of having something that is HTML friendly, I've got something that's just a text document that we could save and print out for somebody easily. Same content. Different, all it is is a different style sheet. And then we've also got one that would actually download you a, a spreadsheet that had all of this information in it. The, um, let's go back to the presentation. So in terms of sort of pseudo coding, what we did was, and if, and if you want to, you can look at the code. And by the way, this uh, um, QR code will take you to the GitHub. I've also got the link for a little bit later. Uh, is basically it just goes through and takes what you typed in on the web form, sanitizes it because you never want to trust a user to put in stuff that isn't malicious, <laughs> uh, and then uh, uh, build a query string. And in my uh, PHP code, what I've done is just gone through one by one and uh, um, taken each of the parameters from the, the, the web form and then hooked them up to a variable, and then I added the variables together to make a long string. I could have done it all in much fewer statements, but I wanted to have something that would be at least a little bit readable. Uh, then I set the curl options that I need uh, in PHP, fire it off, it goes and gets the result set from, from Dwayne's pasta system, brings it back, runs a style sheet on it, out comes the result, and it displays the results on the, on the web. Uh, and I did add some error handling on the style sheet just because sometimes you get weird characters in there, and I wanted to make sure it wasn't going to completely crash if that happened. So that's everything that's there. Now this is the, uh, what you have on your, your sheet there is we've got, uh, uh, this whole system is implemented using a web form that consists of 11 lines. <laughs> You've got a, a PHP program that consists of 112 lines, and you have a style sheet that consists of 41 lines. This is the one that does the full featured HTML catalog. The one that does the CSV file is actually a little bit less. Uh, how many people here are familiar with, uh, with uh, uh, let's start off with, with web forms. How many people have done stuff with web forms? Okay, so I see see some hands out there. Uh, tell you what, I'll 
I will actually traverse to this so that we can, this is the, um, the, the uh, GitHub repository for this stuff. And so the, the web form is just that little bit of code. And what that's doing is, is just telling you what the names of the fields are and saying how big they should be and whether or not there's a list you should select things off of. Um, there's, then there's the, uh, the PHP is sort of the, the real work horse in this. And that's this one here. And, and there it's you know, going through sanitizing the inputs. And then it's going through and making some decisions about uh, setting up some variables that I'm going to use to create that long string. And then down here, I'm going and hooking together all of those pieces together, sort of appending, 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 appending to make these long, complex search strings that Dwayne has shown us that we could have just made easily. Once the search string is created, it then sets the, those curl options set some error handling functions for what comes back. And by the way, at this point, once we've done that result one curl exec, we've actually gone and fetched our result set. And then now we just want to style it. And so I've got some options there for making it so that if there are any errors, it'll catch them and uh, loading that up. And then down here, I select which, my, which uh, document type I'd like to produce, which style sheet I want to run. And then I go down to the bottom and run it, and I'm done. You guys now have mastered the entire art of creating a web portal for, uh, for this. Now, one of the things I want to emphasize on this is that uh, this is not something we, we've given you an example with pasta. But pasta is not the only thing that, uh, that, uh, that could do this. Um, if we wanted to, there are a number of repositories, places like Data One, that also have APIs. Their API is going to be probably a little bit different. Actually, it's still probably going to use Solar. I know it uses Solar, uh, but you could, you, if you want to build a system like this on top of a different repository, you can do that. Uh, but that being said, uh, we do have some materials up front here for you as you're leaving about EDI if you want to learn a little bit more about it. So basically, in order to make your data available through a catalog, all you have to do is get the data into EDI, and then you can use the, uh, the uh, interface to, to pull it out. Now, there's some things that obviously could be enhanced about this. Right now, I've got it so that uh, if you click on the, the, the highlighted link over here, it's going to go out back to the data portal. Maybe you don't want to go to that data portal. Maybe you'd like to style it locally. If that's the case, then you need to set up your own way of styling it. There's some LTR websites that can share some style sheets that they've got. Um, there's also an, there's a, an R package that's called EML render that would actually could be used to create a style document. Uh, and then, um, and if you want to, you can just take those files out of GitHub, copy them anywhere in your web space, and you've now got the system. You know, the, the same system I demoed will work on any web server that's PHP enabled, where you have stashed those, uh, the, the, uh, the, the web form, the PHP document, and one or more of the style sheets. Uh, so, uh, the, uh, if you want to get fancy, you don't have to use PHP. If you love Python, it works in Python. I did a demo of that, just, just took about an hour to, to get it all working in that as well. Uh, lots of choices uh, uh, out there in terms of exactly what technology you want to use to do it. And then, uh, and then, like I say, you can just go there and pull down that code and do a little tweaks to it to make it so that it's the way you desire it. Also, if you know what your query string looks like, you can just plain make it so that uh, uh, you can set it up so it, it doesn't accept user input, but just does sort of the standard query. Like if you wanted to list everything for your site, maybe you don't want somebody to be searching on a particular you don't want them searching for the word kelp. You just want everything to come back, in which case you could just do a query star 
you know, uh, star for the query and everything would, uh, would be there. And I think that's my last uh, slide. So we'll now go over to show that you don't even need to be using PHP or, or anything like that because uh, Stephen's going to show us how to do it in R. Right. Hey, everybody. Um, before I start, does anybody have a Bunsen burner? <laughs> no? Oh, this was my best shot. Shoot. All right. Hey, everyone. My name is Stephen Earle. I'm the information manager in the Central Arizona Phoenix LCR. And for the next 10 minutes, I'm basically going to just repeat everything that Dr. John Porter said, but with a slightly different approach, and that's away from XSLP. And this is mostly just to demonstrate that what we showed here today, there are a lot of ways to address it. So you can use an approach that works best with your system. I'm sorry. Question no, already. I was saying, you're not going to be right. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Okay, that's right. So you can use a portable mic one or another. But I'll stand. Really I'll stand back here. That's okay, John. Thank you. Okay. Um, Dr. Porter has given us a really nice example and kind of overview of how you might use that API to generate a, uh, a local data catalog, pulling that information from the EDI site. Um, he has used what I would characterize as a very traditional approach to working with XML data, and that is to style it for display which with XSLT. One of the challenges with XSLT, however, is that it can be very difficult to learn and to implement. And I, I got to throw up this quote from Jerome Ooms with our open side because I just love this. And I won't read it word for word, but Jerome was basically saying how, you know, at one time, the entire web, it was envisaged that it would be operating on XML, and we just style it all with XSLT. But people realize that XSLT is kind of complicated, and they shied away from it. Of course, that is not the way that it went. So it can be difficult to learn. It can also be somewhat constraining in its implementation. And let me give you a very specific example. So this is a screenshot of one very small section of the CAPLTR data catalog. We are running two parallel system, or a parallel system, where we are pushing data and metadata to the EDI catalog. We also keep a copy of those data and the metadata locally, so we can generate our own cop our own catalog of the exact same thing. Um, very redundant, and kind of what we're insinuating with this session today is some, that it's something you may not want to do. Okay, the, the catalog itself, though, is database driven. So we keep just enough metadata in the database to facilitate searching keywords, titles, authors, those kinds of things. And it also kind of serves as our kind of bookkeeping system for the data sets that we're generating. If you find a data set, or the user finds a data set of interest, however, at that point, you click on that, that particular package. You are then moved away from the database. You know, so here's just one example data set with a lot more metadata going down off the screen that you don't see. So what we're doing with a particular data package, however, is we're pulling the metadata from the XML file associated with that package, and then we're styling it for display using an XSLT, exactly what kind of Dr. Porter has described earlier. This works great. It works just fine. However, in the past, we have at times wanted to enrich the metadata of our um, data sets, which what the user would actually see on the web page. We have wanted to do things like we wanted to add imagery. We wanted to, particularly with like geospatial files, we wanted to add like a preview of what the, of the shape or the KML file of what the user would download before they would actually go through the process of downloading it. Um, some data visualizations, really kind of these kind of visual enhancements to our data sets. Now, I don't do much of the web work at ASU. We have a whole team of people that does that. We have um, web designers and web programmers. And at times on that team, we have had some outstanding programmers. None of them would touch this. Not that it can't be done. In fact, if you haven't been on the EDI catalog, um, I'll show a screenshot in a minute. It has a really nice Google map interface that shows the kind of the area of a research study of the kind of research study. So it can be done. I'm just arguing that it, it's, it's difficult. And so in our case, we couldn't warrant the overhead um, of adding those features to this at the expense of, of other things that we wanted to address. So what I'm going to do for just the next couple minutes is, again, kind of um, go through kind of exactly what Dr. Porter did, but I'm going to use a, a different approach. And I have built a, just a very crude, really simple model, and I have used R. Now, as Dr. Porter and I think Gastiel mentioned, the language doesn't matter. You can do this in anything. Um, and in fact, we are going to do this at ASU, not for the CAPLTR, but for another research entity. We are going to build a data catalog using this functionality, and the web guys are going to use React, which is, as much as I dislike um, Facebook, is really cool, I got to admit. But anyway, the point is that the language doesn't really matter. 
Okay, so um, what I'm doing here, kind of behind the scenes, and you don't, of course, I'm not going to go through all the code, but what I'm doing is basically the same approach using R, where, as Dr. Porter was using PHP. I'm using the API to get the data of interest, I'm bringing it in, and I'm parsing that. Now, once I parsed it, it's just objects, and you can do whatever you want with those objects. And in this case, I'm going to put them together in a table, and I'm going to render that table as an HTML. So I don't have a live demo, just a screenshot, but this does work, trust me. And what I have here is a simple interface. It's just a, it's just a keyword, but of course, as, as Dwayne pointed out, you can pass whatever parameters you like to that solar query. It's very, very flexible. And so I'm getting at some results here, and what I've done is I've just pulled the pieces that I want and styled it such that it is identical to the table that Dr. Porter um, produced with his PHP and XSLT, just to show you that we could produce the exact same thing, um, but using an entirely different approach. Okay, as Dr. Porter also mentioned, this is kind of the first step, right? You want to kind of generate the catalog, but the next step, of course, is you need to make these data resources available to your user, and there's a couple of different ways to do that. Um, just like Dr. Porter did, he put a link to the data set that takes you to the EDI catalog. I've done that here, so here's one the, the screenshot of one row of the catalog I built with a link button that'll take you to that particular data set in the EDI catalog. So it was revealed to me in the conversations leading up to this session that what you see on the right, and that is actually kind of a part of a display of, the, of a data set in the EDI catalog, is that that display is rendered with 11,000 lines of XSLT. I cannot even get my mind around 11,000 lines of XSLT. But the critical point there is that that's all done for you. Somebody else did that work, you know, and that's, yeah, what, I mean, what a fantastic resource to take advantage of. Now, you could modify this approach even a little bit. You don't necessarily have to take the user to the EDI catalog itself. You could even iframe that in so that you wouldn't have to leave, have the user leave your site entirely. Um, if you want to maintain some of your branding as well, you could do it um, using that approach. But even that said, let's say that doesn't work. Let's say it's not um, appropriate to link out to the EDI catalog. Well, you can use the exact same approach that you use, that we use to generate the catalog to get the end data or the metadata and data associated with an individual data package. And here's what I've done, uh, a very, very simple example of that. I'm just using the exact same thing. I'm using it through R, I'm using that API to get the data for not a whole bunch of diff different data sets, but for one particular data set. I'm parsing those XML data into objects. Now I can put those things together any way that I want, pull out what I want, string them together the way I want, whatever we want to do. And here it's just title, publication, abstract. I'm rendering those things in HTML. Now in both cases, I'm rendering in HTML, so you can just use CSS and style these things any way you want. So the critical point here, or a critical point, is that I haven't used XSLT for any of the styling. Another critical point is that because we're just working with objects, you want to bring in a leaflet, you want to bring in imagery, you want to bring in whatever, some data visualization, just bring it in. There's just objects that you can glue together. Um, and that's it. Just a very crude, kind of simple mock-up, but just, we want to demonstrate that there are really a lot of different ways to approach this. The, the API is extremely flexible to accommodate whatever approach you might want to use or need to use um, in your particular system. So that is all I had. Castile, do you have any styling you wanted to address? Or? Uh, several times we've mentioned branding. Or Okay. LTR sites are all funded by <coughs> National Science Foundation, and the National Science Foundation really likes to see their logo on our websites. <laughs> uh, and as well, each, each uh, LTR site is, is hosted at an institution. In this case, Plum Island is at the Marine Biological Lab. Uh, often that institution likes to put its branding on a page. And also, uh, in the lead investigator or communications interested or expert people at sites uh, spend a lot of time figuring out how they want their own user interface to appeal to their colleagues or potential students. Uh, each site's put a lot of effort into making their data accessible, findable, searchable, um, browsable, and relevant to the users they're expecting will come looking for their data. Uh, so you see each LTER site has a different design, but all of these sites 
contribute their data, their metadata to PASTA and could populate the contents of these catalogs using the API. Uh, here's an example of a, of a geographic visualization. Uh, Bonanza Creek has a particularly smart expertise in, in GIS and visualization of geography. <laughs> okay. Uh, just so when, when we're saying customize the styles, the user interface, the branding, that's what we mean by that. Uh, now, one of the things that we've talked sort of a lot about LTER, but uh, in the back of the room there in the middle, hold up your hand, Corinna, is, uh, is uh, Corinna Grease, who's the, the head of, uh, of the EDI, the Environmental Data Initiative. And what that means is it now means that PASTA is not just LTER. PASTA can be anybody that uh, wants to talk, talk to Corinna and uh, set up a relationship. Uh, it, it's not, not restricted to that. But like I said, this is something that can be done with any number of uh, data catalogs. It, doesn't, it isn't just with, uh, with, with PASTA. We've used that as an example because that's the one we know best, but it's only an example. Anyway, are there any, any sort of questions that people have? The PA in PASTA means uh, provenance aware, right? Yes. Um, I didn't really see any provenance in this. Uh, so yeah. Uh, well, yeah. No. Well, no. Well, I actually, what it is is that one of the elements in ecological metadata that is that it has a place where you can record provenance information about which data sets were combined to create a new one, and. Pasta, the PASTA system supports web services that help you create those elements and to add them into documents. That, that's mostly where you, you are correct that the, the PASTA is the provenance aware synthesis the tracking architecture. And, but that's, that's where that part is. It, it's, it's not as explicit as, a, as it might be, but, but, the, but there is that in the, in the, in the, in the database. Other questions? Sure. Can you, for, can you search for attributes also? Like if I want a data set that has like nitrates and dissolved oxygen together. I, I'm not sure. I, maybe I missed it. But when do you like, address that for the uh, speaker up the microphone up there? Okay. For, for here. Right, attribute names. There are things that are not currently indexed. I think part of the problem is the lack of standardization in naming attributes. Uh, but if somebody could make the case that that's a field that should be indexed, then we can start indexing it. But yeah, I think I, I'd argue attribute labels are a better thing to search for than attribute names because they a little bit worse. I I see a hand up back there. Somebody has a statement on that. I'll say it is asking again in two months. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Not today. Okay. Um, get, we're working on it. Give me a couple months. <laughs> Other, uh, yeah, I want to add an answer to that too. The latest of what Margaret's work. So, my office mate Margaret works on the semantic annotation that will enable eventually having an attribute dictionary, or that's our fancy word for measurement dictionary. And when I was looking at features of local catalogs that weren't yet possible, that was my favorite one that. Sh shows most clearly how the resource could be best allocated. If, if we have an attribute dictionary, it would be at the network level, and PASTA would use it, and then we'd all be able to use it. We wouldn't have to each code our own attribute dictionary. For the remote folks here. As long as you're talking about um, attribute dictionaries. There's a session tomorrow where a project that I have with um, Data One, we're actually playing with measurement plane. We have a met, uh, attribute dictionary for carbon cycling measurements and tomorrow afternoon we have a session where we actually want to try mapping attribute names in these some of these more cryptic data sets to the um, terms in that vocabulary. So look for it. Uh, hit the, hit the uh, microphone button in front of you there. Oh, 
Ja. I had two questions. One is the is that a, is the HTTP API is that described anywhere? I was surfing around, I couldn't find it. Found it. Okay. Does that okay? Okay. All right. What what whatever that turns up. Google Google rules. Okay. Um, the the other is uh, when I tried to grab everything, I got about forty two thousand and change records. Is that about right as far as the full content of the system? I didn't exclude anything. Star, star, star. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, in that case, I mean, as long as long as that doesn't increase by like two orders of magnitude, it would be helpful if you provided an API that just said get everything. So if somebody wants to snarf the whole thing, because that's small enough that sucking it, the whole thing into R and messing around with it is quite easy. So. Um, No, no, I, I, you, you know, I, I, I can repeat it. You were talking about you had a query up there that when you set like the rows to star and the and the fields to star and the query to star, you get everything. Yeah, yeah, okay, um, yeah. I, but when you do that, it takes like minutes, and it, you know, it, it's obviously running through a bunch of querying where what it could really be doing is just sending you a zip file of the whole thing, and it would be essentially instantaneous. That's why I'm saying it would be handy to have that just bypass the whole search mechanism. Sure. Oh, yeah. I mean, that, this, this, be, this is a wonderful wad of XML to play with. And plus, you can load it into these pack. You know, R has very sophisticated facilities for essentially querying XML yourself, constructing queries that you may not have thought of. So it'd be, it'd be a very handy thing to have. Yeah. Just, just saying. <laughs> yep. Now, I'm trying to remember on the, on the timing of this session. Are we going until 3.30? Is that right? Yeah. Okay, so we have time for additional questions, or if you want to, uh, if people would like to hit the break a little bit early and come up, or come up here and try, uh, try out uh, some of the systems on the screen, or, or uh, go to that GitHub site, download those files, stick them on your server, and try them out there. Uh, Oh, we'll be glad to sort of help with that. So, uh, any uh, any last questions? Okay, but I I hear out there somebody actually found in their data at an Italian restaurant. That's oh, a no. <laughs> anyway, I. Yes. Yes. Well. Yes. Well, there there are those who have proposed that we should should affiliate with the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster. But uh, anyway, uh, on 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 that note, uh, uh, we will uh, we'll close out the session. And thanks thanks for your interest. And uh, if you see any of us around, please feel free to grab us at any time and chat about this. I will say that. Uh, you know, having some familiarity with PHP and having some familiarity with uh, with XSLT, and I will say that also this is one of those things of where you stand depends on where you, where you sit, uh, because for me it's much easier to do XSLT than to style it in R. But anyway, uh, I wanted yeah. to add that our travel team meeting was sponsored by environmental data initiative. Yeah, so you have the ED, yes, EDI helped us get here. So anyway, uh, thanks a lot for coming, and uh, we hope to see you around the rest of the conference.